I'm not really sure what happened there. Everything was going along fine and episodes were coming out on a regular basis, one after another with very few problems. And then suddenly, life. So much life, in fact, that the thread tying everything together became lost and a certain amount of scrambling around in the dark had to occur in order for it to be picked up again. Still, all the pieces are right there and have been since the beginning of this year. It shouldn't be too hard to pick them up again and get it all in proper order. We let off with an episode about seasons that explained why there's a difference between the American and British method of denoting a connected batch of television episodes and talked about how people like Charles Dickens kicked off a new way of publishing fiction in installments that opened up a market for the sort of fantastical stories that became known as pulp fiction a name which was based on the fact that the newer, cheaper method of making paper from wood pulp made it so that publishers could take a chance on untested authors and only publish full books if the public demand was there, unlike the much more expensively published volumes of the Western classics, which priced themselves right out of reach of the working populace, not to mention the poor in general, just by being printed. This, of course, also meant that the average citizen of the day, that day being the Renaissance, just didn't have access to the kind of education and reading material needed to support it that the rich did. Which is why the wealthy had the time and the ability to dig into the classics of Western literature and get up to all sorts of unusual things, like the things suggested by the writing attributed to Hermes Trismegistus, which hinted that there were rules on how things behaved in the heavens and that they were tied to the way things behaved here on Earth which was encapsulated by the phrase, as above, so below, as coined by the fictional Hermes himself and subsequently picked up by his followers down through the centuries. So, believing the instructions were encoded in writings attributed to Hermes, the well-to-do of the Renaissance once again took up an interest in things like alchemy and astrology, even though those had been largely dismissed as ridiculous centuries prior by the very Greeks, Romans, and Arabs, who had provided the translations of Hermes and other classical figures that brought them back to the attention of the Western world once again in the first place. And so compelling was the idea of as above, so below, in a world newly interested in how everything worked, that other thinkers thought that it must all be true, and so began developing ways of proving the fundamental interconnectedness of all things which really got a bit hairy when a fellow named Emanuel Swedenborg popped up and declared that he had been given a divine revelation about how it was all supposed to work, and that it was all about correspondences. You know, like fire makes you warm, and so too does love, and so the two must be related. To love was to kindle a fire in the heart, or something. And all this correspondence pointed back to the one true religion, of which all others are but an error-riddled mishmash of half-understood truths. Fortunately, Swedenborg didn't make much of it himself. But a decade after his death, others did, and so the Swedenborgian religion was begun, which sought to cleave as close to the truth reportedly revealed to Swedenborg and his private audiences with God and the angels. Basically a Christian religion, but with a deeper core surrounding the newly revealed truth, Believers like John Chapman, better known as Johnny Appleseed, were sent around the fledgling United States spreading the good word and making converts out of anyone who might listen. In turn, Swedenborgianism, when combined with the fun new fad of oriental hypnotism embodied in mesmerism, helped open the door and formed the core of another new religion called spiritualism, in which believers sought to connect with the spirits of the dearly departed and communicate with them about the world beyond ours. You can blame the sudden popularity of spiritualism on the Fox sisters, who, by cracking their toes under the table, managed to convince a legion of followers that there was indeed another side to connect with, and that they were definitely really truly in contact with it. Eventually, of course, the truth came out, and the sisters admitted to faking the whole thing as a practical joke on their mother. But by then the damage was done, and spiritualism had a reasonably firm foothold on which to grow. Which is exactly where we left the story last time. Yep, they've all been interconnected. Fundamentally. 
I'm surprised you didn't see that coming. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The name to keep a firm eye on here is Helena Blavatsky. Born in Russia to an aristocratic family in 1831, Helena traveled around the Russian Empire seeing the sights and teaching herself whatever it was she thought she needed to know. And it wasn't long before she wandered into strange company. Eventually, Blavatsky would claim later in life that as a teenager she had traveled around the world, stopping in Europe, the Americas, and India, and meeting up with what she referred to as a series of spiritual adepts called the Masters of Ancient Wisdom, who then further broadened her experiences by sending her to Tibet, where she would learn the secrets of religion, science, and philosophy, and how they all fitted together with each other. See, things had really sort of got out of hand with the new spiritualism movement, which, as we mentioned, wasn't really new at all. Mostly it was just coming around again for a second, or possibly third tour, since its first tour had got lost in the historical shuffle, at least until the Renaissance. After the Renaissance, spiritualism had once again faded into the background, until the Fox sisters came along and it hung around the fringes being practiced by the sorts of people who had a keen eye for a dollar and a good line of talk. No one else really took it all that seriously, until it became entertainment in the 1800s. In fact, it got so fringy that it got lumped into a whole collection of other fringe beliefs and practices collectively called Western esotericism, or in the more fanciful minds of the day, the Western mystery tradition. The idea being that Western esotericism encompassed all sorts of off-kilter philosophies that were distinct and separate from the prevailing Judeo-Christian religion and the accepted Enlightenment rationalism of the day. Note that this does not necessarily lump in any and all non-Christian or non-Jewish religions. You won't necessarily find Buddhism or Islam or Shintoism or any other religion automatically included in the category, and Confucianism and other modes of philosophical thought aren't involved either. Rather, Western esotericism is meant to capture ideas and modes of thought that arose particularly from the offshoots of Western society and Western thinking that got a bit carried away with themselves and departed from what was the most regularly accepted ideas of Western society. So, to qualify as an element of Western mystery tradition, and the reason I like that name for it particularly, the ideas represented had to have come from Western tradition and must also include a certain amount of what can charitably be described as an enchanted worldview. So, for instance, our old friend Hermeticism qualifies, as does Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, a belief not so much in a particular religion or philosophy, but in the religion and philosophy specifically practiced by Plato. Here you can find Rosicrucianism, Freemasonry, various occult beliefs, Paganism, Wicca, most of the 1960s, and certainly the 1970s interest in the New Age. See also cryptozoology, which you can hear about in our episode on Sasquatch, and other schools of thought where things have to be just a little bit magical to work as advertised. Well, you can imagine, given the last several episodes, which of the various ideas we've discussed here have ended up classified as Western esotericism. Anything that relied on correspondences and as above, so below, for instance. So there's your astrology and alchemy. Anything that espoused a living nature or all-encompassing life force. So there's all of Star Wars. Anything that claimed that by performing certain rituals or making certain symbols or contacting intermediaries or repeating certain phrases that you could gain access to different levels of reality from the material world to the divine was definitely a case for esotericism, which meant all sorts of things like seances, tarot readings, Ouija boards, and more were part of it. As was anything that promised to transform a person into a different or improved being, simply by following a specific set of teachings. The old, we will ascend as gods if you just drink this Kool-Aid, or hitch a ride on this spaceship, or check out the etchings of one particular person over and over again, deal. Of course, all the one true original religions 
went into the pot as well. Basically, anything that claimed religion as practiced today was but a bastardized version of what God actually meant to have happen. Goodbye, Swedenborgianism. And finally, you could certainly spot Western esotericism simply by the mere mention of revealed truth as taught by a master to his disciple via an initiation of some sort. And you can see where that leaves us with Helena Blavatsky. Her whole trip to Tibet and the Masters of Ancient Wisdom routine put her right smack in the middle of Western esotericism with hardly any effort at all. And by the 1870s, Blavatsky was deeply involved in the whole spiritualist movement. Soon she moved to the United States and began gaining fame and attention as a spirit medium. Then, Around about 1875, Blavatsky and two friends, Henry Steele Olcott and William Kwan Judge, founded something called the Theosophical Society in New York City. And sure enough, they promised to synthesize science, religion, and philosophy together by means of reviving the ancient wisdom that lay at the foundation of all the world's religions. And then, after publishing a few books on the topic of theosophy, she and Olcott up sticks and moved to India where they become involved in the Hindu reform movement and become among the first people from the United States to convert to Buddhism, while at the same time spreading the ideas and teachings of her theosophy throughout the country. In fact, it's thanks to Blavatsky and Olcott that Buddhism and Hinduism gained a foothold in the West. Prior to their involvement, the British ruling class in India had gone to considerable lengths to poo-poo the various Indian religious traditions. Blavatsky was, apparently, the first Westerner to really take them seriously and embrace their teachings, seeing in Buddhism especially a sort of kindred spirit working to the same goals as those professed by theosophy. When Olcott and Blavatsky returned to the West a few years later, they brought Buddhist teachings with them and incorporated them into their theosophist teachings. So popular did this combination prove that it wasn't long before they added to their runaway success in India and Ceylon, with a further following in France, the United Kingdom, and elsewhere in Europe. By 1885, there were 121 theosophical lodges, as they were called, around the world, 106 of them in India alone. Still, it wasn't all sunshine and roses. Blavatsky's health was failing, and increasingly she had to face charges that her supposed occult demonstrations and seances were frauds. The very Theosophical Society itself was gradually self-destructing, as internal strife between the leadership of the various lodges resulted in splinter groups forming and breaking away from the main Theosophical body. Still, enough of it held together that combined with the publication of several books on the topic from Blavatsky herself, she managed to weather a storm of accusers and exposers and grow the society, spreading its teachings far and wide. And what exactly were the teachings of theosophy, teachings that got it grouped as a type of Western esotericism? Well, for starters, there wasn't really a god, not as the Christians professed at least. God was more of a universal divine principle from which all things emerged and to which all things would eventually return and be reabsorbed. Which meant, of course, that each bit of matter was infused with a spark of the divine and that the lower orders of creation came from the higher orders, which in many ways dovetailed nicely with the new sciences of geology and biological evolution that had come to the fore in the 19th century making it look like Blavatsky's teachings were more legitimate than they might otherwise seem. Of course, then there was the bit where the primordial nothingness at the beginning of time divided itself into seven rays, which became seven intelligent beings called Diane Cohens that created the universe with a special kind of energy called Fohat. According to her writings, the Earth was created, or in fact was still being created, in seven rounds, with each round being populated by different sorts of living beings. Now, you'd be tempted to dismiss all this as utter nonsense, completely made up by Blavatsky. For what reason? Well, to help make money to fund her lifestyle, mostly, especially with the supposed demonstrations of supernatural powers in contact with the other side that were still occasioned by her ongoing work as a spiritual medium. And lots of people did dismiss it and call her out as a fraud. But perhaps theosophy 
is more important for the people who did buy into it than for those who didn't. Tolstoy was known to quote from various passages of Blavatsky's works and apparently greatly admired the theosophist viewpoint. Blavatsky, in turn, was a great admirer of his writing, calling him the greatest novelist and mystic of Russia. She translated several of his works into English, along with works by Dostoevsky, in whom she saw something of a kindred spirit when it came to their view of the Roman Catholic Church and modern theology. Poet W.B. Yeats was so taken with theosophy that he established the Dublin Hermetic Society along with his friends George Russell and Charles Johnson. This later became the Irish section of the Theosophical Society and served as fertile grounds for Yeats' interest in mysticism. He would later rise to an official position as a member of the Recording Committee for Occult Research in London before abruptly finding himself expelled for oddly, doing occult research experiments forbidden by the society. Frankly, though, the real standouts of theosophy, as outlined by Blavatsky herself, were working in the pulps. According to her, some of the best examples of theosophical works included The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde by Robert Louis Stevenson, King Solomon's Minds and She, A History of Adventure by H. Ryder Haggard, and The Brother of the Shadow by Rosa Campbell Prayed, among others. Pretty much any literature with mystical elements from the late 1800s to the early 1900s earned her admiration and approval and, in part, helped fuel their success. Perhaps, though, no fiction writer was better than Helena Blavatsky herself. Oh, by no means was she considered a great writer of genre fiction per se, but certainly what she wrote about theosophy and its core beliefs and the influences those writings would later have on others deserves some sort of award for accomplishments in fiction. Take, for example, her writing on root races. In her book, The Secret Doctrine, Blavatsky tackled human evolution within the cosmology of theosophy. According to her, there are seven root races assembling on Earth, each of which was or will be based on its own now lost continent. So far, only five of the root races have appeared, and we'll just have to wait until the 28th century to see the sixth. The first root race was the Polarian, an ethereal race of beings composed of etheric matter that lived on and around the sacred Buddhist mountain at the center of all creation called Mount Meru. The earth was still cooling at the time, so as you might expect, there isn't really much of a historical record to check but Blavatsky assures readers that the Polarian reproduced by dividing like amoeba. So maybe they didn't have much to write down in the first place. The second root race is one you're sure to have heard of if you spend any amount of time around heroic fantasy games or literature. It is, of course, the golden yellow people of Hyperborea. At the time, Hyperborea was made up of what is now northern Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Scandinavia, northern Asia, and Kamchatka. Everything was arranged differently way back then, you see. Oh, also, it was all tropical because the earth wasn't tilted then. They called themselves Kimpershas and, according to Blavatsky, reproduced by budding. These were followed by the third root race, the Lemurians, who naturally lived on the continent of Lemuria, located somewhere in the Indian Ocean. Eventually destroyed by a succession of volcanic events and a gradual sinking, all that remains of Lemuria is Madagascar, bits of New Guinea, and Australia. Which does beg the question of exactly how big Lemuria was meant to be, if Australia is just a bit of it. The Lemurian race, according to theosophists, began about 34 million years ago during the Jurassic. You know, where they keep all the dinosaurs. Mostly they reproduced by laying eggs, and just why was Blavatsky so interested in delineating how each of these root races reproduced? In any case, they did eventually get with the times and learn to reproduce as we modern humans do. Isn't that nice? And of course, once you have Lemurians, you can't help but have Atlanteans, and sure enough, they come along as the fourth root race, although they're really supposed to be an evolutionary offshoot of the Lemurians who colonized parts of Africa when Lemuria was sinking. Little did they know what would happen to Atlantis. The fools. Still, from the Atlanteans and their moves around the world come, and we quote here, Red American Indians, Brown Malayans, and Yellow Mongolians. 
And up to now, it's all been a bit of fun, really. Lots of silly little ideas that no one is forced to take too seriously. Oh sure, if you want to be a theosophist, you sort of have to take them seriously. But beyond that, it's all okay to point and chuckle a bit. But then you get to the fifth root race. The one we're in right now, according to Blavatsky. The one that's really going to cause problems for the rest of this episode. The one that comes after the fourth root race and is therefore superior to all the previous root races because this isn't just a list, it's a hierarchy. Each subsequent race being higher up the chain than the last. And the reason the fifth root race is going to be so problematic is because the fifth root race is the Aryans. The Aryans descended from the Atlanteans either 100,000 years ago or 1 million years ago, depending on whether or not you want to believe Blavatsky meant what she wrote down, even though the dates conflicted with other things she said were going on at the time. Whatever the case, the Aryans were sort of created from the Atlanteans by one of the masters of the ancient wisdom and sent on their way out of Atlantis to migrate around the world. They set up the city of the bridge and the city of the sun, in the middle of the Gobi and Sahara deserts respectively. Of course, these were vast inland seas at the time, so that was okay. But good gosh and golly were they white. So white they referred to themselves as moon-colored, and you might think that's a bit much, but it's really crossing the line to refer to the island the city of the bridge is on as the White Island and then to claim that the position of the city is right under the ethereal city of Shambhala, home of Earth's governing deity, and that therefore everything the Aryans have done has been guided by the divine hand, and, well, you can see where it's all headed at this point. And yes, it does turn out that Blavatsky is just as racist as you are now worried she might be. See, according to her, no amount of culture or training or teaching or anything else could ever hope to raise the savages of the world, you know who she means, to the same level of intelligence as the Aryans. They lack the sacred spark, you see. But that's okay. Because, again, according to Blavatsky, all the lesser races are rapidly dying out to make way for the much better Aryans. Now, just to head you off at the pass, there's no proof of a direct connection between Blavatsky's theosophy and the rise of the National Socialist Party in Germany. No proof at all, which is something we have to say because it's the truth. But it's also true to say that Ariosophy, or Arminism as it is also known, is an esoteric ideological system that hangs on the idea of the wisdom of the Aryans as espoused by Blavatsky. And it's true that there was a renewed interest in all things occult and the new spiritualism in Germany and Austria during the early 1900s. And further, it is true to say that the pioneers of Ariosophy were themselves interested in and influenced by the teachings of Helena, Blavatsky, and Theosophy. And swirling around it all were further elements of German paganism, romanticism, and after World War I, a need to find a new German sense of purpose and identity. But to say Nazism was directly influenced by Theosophy and Ariosophy, and that it was all Blavatsky's fault? Well, that's just too simple. Too easy. The world really is more complicated than that. But it probably didn't help that a young man named Adolf Hitler was a regular reader and collector of a magazine called Ostara, in which the Ariosophical ideas of one Lanz von Liebenfalls, who got his ideas, at least in part, from Blavatsky's theosophy and its teachings, were serialized. Thank you for listening to GM Word of the Week, Series 2. That's right, series, in the British model. Which is how things are going to go around here for a little while. 
With Series 2 complete, a bit of time will pass before Series 3 is fully prepared and presented to you. I expect it will be a month or so before Series 3 begins. I've already got some ideas about what shape the next series will take, but it's going to need more than the usual amount of research that goes into one-off episodes. I'd like to keep connecting them up as I did in Series 2, but to do that I've got to plan things out further than we've usually done before. So I hope you'll bear with me as I put together an entire series of episodes ahead of recording and releasing them to you. In the meantime, if you enjoyed Series 2 and were happy to see it all connected up in what I hope was a reasonably surprising manner, please consider heading over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and joining up for a membership there. Your support not only makes the show possible by allowing me to focus on working on it instead of 9 to 5 but you'll get early access to episodes, transcripts, and the ability to join in on monthly supporter chats as well as bonus members-only content. Head over to buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback and check it out. GM Word of the Week is a Fiddleback production and is researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions.